What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And before I introduce today's guest, Holly Lyman of Wild Tonic, I just want to say you can check out other episodes on the podcast. You know, Holly, I like to have people on and products on that I admire, that I love, like Wild Tonic. I love it. And other past episodes include I had one of the ladies at, at Truth Bar. Um, I love Truth Bar. You know, I've had Ryan Lee from Rewind Bars. I've had um, Jim Simon from Jimmy Bars. I've had RX Bar founder Peter Rahal. And all those talk about their journey, but they're also products that I personally love and that I eat or drink or whatever it is. So check out other episodes on inspiredinsider.com. And before I introduce Holly officially, today's episode is brought to you by Rise25 at Rise25. We help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships, and we do that by helping you run your podcast. Um, and you know, Holly, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. I've seen no better way to do that in the past over decade than have them on my podcast. I have the people I admire, the companies I admire on that I can profile them and share their thought leadership with the world. So, if you are a company and you've thought of this podcast thing or producing content, um, we are an easy button. We are a solution. So you can go to rise25.com and check out more. We've been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, today's guest, uh, I'm excited, Holly Lyman, founder of Wild Tonic. Uh, she's an artist from Alaska who mastered the ancient art of June kombucha, among other ferments. And she grows many of the ingredients actually on her ranch in Sedona, Arizona, some of the flavors, my favorite flavor personally, Holly, is blueberry basil, okay? Uh, they have mango ginger, they have blackberry mint. They also have hard kombucha as well. And so we're going to talk about our journey. And if you go to a grocery store or, um, and you see, it just sticks out. The bottle, if, you could, if you're watching the video and you can see behind, that blue bottle, that rich blue bottle just, just calls out that you want to just grab it off the shelf and drink it, at least for me. So Holly, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for having me on the show. Um, the necklace you're wearing, that yeah. I notice is <laughs> because I, you know, love the blueberry basil. That's on the bottle. I yeah. would love for you to talk about creating the bottle because that sticks out, that jumps out to me when I was walking in and actually I was just in Arizona. And oh, no so, you know, I'm in Chicago, but I was just in Arizona and I was in AJ's fine foods. And I grabbed the wild tonic blueberry basil and it sticks out that B oh, on the yeah. front of the bottle. So what is the significance of that? Well, so our, our ferment is made with honey instead of sugar. And so the B is of course, so integral to, to making our product. And so I designed the bottle out of a, out of a turn of the century beer bottle. I, I had a design of a antique bottle and I just fell in love with the shape of it. And so I designed Wild Tonics bottle to be something that would really capture somebody's imagination when they looked at it. And blue is the color that bees are first attracted to when they go to poll pollinate flowers. And so I didn't know that. Yeah, I just thought, okay, I'm bringing all these things together in the concept of, of the drink. You know, and as an artist, I try to pay attention to every detail of how something is perceived. And so um, the bottle was kind of a, a fun work of art unto itself. And then the ferment, um, the jun kombucha, that was a whole other process. I just fell in love with fermenting everything and anything I could get my hands on. And I found the jun culture and that just became an evolution. I wanna hear about the first things you actually were fermenting, but I do wanna say like when I, when I started to look into Wild Tonic, I'm like, this bottle is beautiful. And then it made sense, like an artist actually created, it is a piece of art. The bottle is a piece of art. Was it hard to take that vision of what you wanted with the bottle to reality? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it definitely, um, it was a process because you have to go to the mold makers and, 
you know, source the bottles. Our bottles are now made in the U.S., which is really a big deal. So we used to source them from China. And we're trying to bring our um, all of our processes back to the U.S. And so now they're made here in the U.S. So there was a lot that went into that. Um, is there like a couple different versions of the mold or how, how did that work? Because yeah, so if you look at the bottle, the it's just a very intricate. Yeah, we have a, a, for our alcohol kombucha, we have a 750 ml um, bottle, which is a lot larger, like a wine bottle. And that's a beautiful bottle. It's not sold everywhere. It's a little hard to find, but um, then we have our 12 ounce bottle and our 16 ounce bottle. So the 12 ounce bottle, we're just getting now ready to sell into Canada. So talk about the slim can, because that, that's can, relatively that's new. new. Yeah. That's brand new. So that's for the hikers, the people who want to take our product and go outdoors with it or go to a gymnasium. Um, it's very light. It's very environmentally friendly. Um, the other thing that's really cool about the bottles is we take them and we, um, we give them to a company in Phoenix called uh, Refresh Glass, and they take the bottles and they turn them into candles and cups. So there's actually, soon we'll be selling those on our website, but it's just a beautiful blue tumbler glass that you can then use day in and day out in your kitchen. I would totally get that. It's beautiful. Yeah. I didn't even want to throw the bottle out. I mean, I mean, <laughs> recycle it even. I'm like, I need to keep this in some fashion. So it's good that you're, you're kind of going that direction. Was that, what was the decision like, uh, evolution of the decision to do the Slim Can? Because I mean, I don't know if I've seen any other kombucha company, maybe they do, actually do a Slim Can. Yeah, I think that that was um, largely because so many of our consumers are outdoor enthusiasts and we just had to have, you know, our, our bottles are so heavy. You know, if you want to go hiking, you don't want to carry an extra pound or two with you. You know, if you bring a couple of It's a good workout. It's fine. Kombucha. Yeah. Yeah. So that was mainly the reason, but it's been hugely popular. It's also allows our consumers to buy it at a low, lower price point because those bottles, as you might imagine, are quite expensive. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Um, the, I want to talk about the evolution. Well, I guess we'll start with fermenting. How did you even get into fermenting? So I started reading a book by Sandra Katz, and it was called The Art of Fermentation. And it just changed my whole reality because ferments are kind of like a lost art, kind of like the painting that I was doing, which is encaustic painting, which is a lost art. But fermenting is something that used to be so integral to integral to our culture. And once refrigeration was developed, all of a sudden, um, you know, ferments became much more esoteric and, you know, hard to find. And uh, fermentation, 80% of our immune system is in our guts. And so there's more foreign DNA in our body than there is our own DNA. And it's really, critical to constantly give your body good bacteria and you know it just it helps uh it helps us stay healthy and so that got me interested in um you know fermenting so i started fermenting and making ginger beers and milk cup beers water cup beers um vegetables you just name it i was fermenting it and i made wines and meads and beers and i came across this uh this very unusual ferment called Jun, and um, it's an ancient ferment. They say, you know, lore has it, it originated in Tibet, and it was an elixir for energy and enlightenment for the warriors. And so I thought, okay. That's I'm why I want to order a keg of a five-gallon keg from you, so I get yeah. the energy of warriors. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And, and so I just, um, I fell in love with this particular ferment and just uh, kept refining it hundreds of recipes later. I, you know, came up with a, a chai pear flavor and that was my first flavor. And then I started developing the other flavors, blueberry basil and the blackberry mint, uh, which are now two of our best sellers and, you know, brought it to market in 2015. I was selling pigs out of the back of my car. It was, um, it's kind of crazy. I had like seven customers and then fast forward five years later, we're in every state in the country and launching into Canada and working on a deal with Europe even. So it's just like gone crazy. And it's been um, it really my team that's built the company. Um, I really just created the drink. It's really the team that, that takes it forward every day. I, I want to hear about the early days of selling <laughs> it, but I do want to point out, you know, one of the, the, the books I was 
you know, kind of perusing was by Dr. Perlmutter, which is the brain maker, the power of gut microbes to heal and protect. And, and he talks about that, how, how important it is to have that. And, and essentially, I mean, just talk about a little bit of the health benefits of kombucha for a second. Sure. Well, so our John kombucha has 42 different strains of bacteria and yeast, and it's a living alcohol. It's a living drink. Um, so because we have a non-alcohol version and an alcohol version, it's really, it's a living ferment. And so um, it basically uh, it has prebiotics in it because of the honey, it's probiotics in it. It, uh, it originates from an organism called a SCOBY, which is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And it's a cellulo cellulose uh, culture where all of the yeast and the bacteria live in this, in this organism that they think of it as a hotel. And then when you add the tea and the honey, all of the yeast falls out of this culture and it consumes the sugars, which is the honey, and it, it transforms it into a beneficial uh, acid for the body, which is very detoxifying and very helpful. And so it's when you, when you watch this dance through a glass jar, because that's how I started fermenting in my kitchen, it's just this magical dance that of uh, the yeast and the bacteria. And it's a very symbiotic relationship where they both support each other and create this just magnificent drink. And yeah. so it just, and then bottling it was like taming the tiger. It's really tough to take this living drink, put it in a bottle and not have it hit the ceiling. I mean, some of our first um, first drinks that we sold to customers, they would open a bottle and literally the drink would hit the ceiling. And I, I've ha I had that happen to a lot of my dear friends who were my first guinea pigs where, you know, happy birthday and so you a package of kombucha. They open it and they spend like the next three hours cleaning their ceiling. So, wow. Yeah, and an adventure. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I, I drink kombucha every single day. Like I was telling you before we hit record. And um, I, even for for nine months was brewing my own kombucha in the kitchen until my wife was like, this, our kitchen looks like a science experiment because <laughs> anyone who knows you take yeah. the SCOBY and it keeps growing. So then I just kept right. making more small right. gallons of kombucha before I had like three of them spread across. <laughs> She's like, you cannot do this any longer. And so right. now I just, it's easier to obviously buy your bottle than for me to, but I just had fun with it, you know? Oh, and it is. It's super fun. We have a whole nursery full of uh, 300 pound scobies and it's an adventure. To that's amazing. That. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with the flavors? Cause you have some unique um, flavors. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm kind of a mad scientist and I love, I just follow my intuition. I love anything that has to do with, um, with herbs or medicinal plants and yeah. and i just um you know i have a, a a shelf full of things to pull off and just start experimenting with and yeah it's so it's trial and error blueberry basil blackberry mint mango ginger yeah. there's tropical turmeric raspberry goji lavender love and the funny thing is you said the chai pear was your first flavor yeah. I didn't really discover that until I went to your website because it's, it's more of a seasonal selection right now. Yeah, it's a fall. It's a fall flavor. And I also yeah. like the idea of combining herbs and fruits. I think that that's just a unique way to make a beverage more interesting. You know, if you think about, um, you know, cherry Coke, I mean, that's not very interesting to me, <laughs> but then you throw in something like vanilla and it gets more interesting. And so I just, I don't know. I always look for the angle on how to liven things up. Yeah. And so you went to visit this, the person, the art of fermentation book. Yeah. What was that Sandor, like? Yeah. yeah. So Sandor, it was, we started an email dialogue when I was in Washington state living there and he said, we'll come out and visit. And so I, I took him up on it and I met him at this little cafe in the middle of nowhere, backwoods, Tennessee. He's like, you're never going to find my place unless you follow me. And that's what I knew it was going to be pretty interesting. And so I met him and followed him through all these back roads, windy roads. And I just thought, where the heck am I going? You know, completely off grid, no electricity. Um, in there it was just this little primitive cabin and it was a fermentation foundation that he's created there where you go and you learn about 
um, fermentation. And wow. so he had all these jars on the wall full of ferments. And, and I had brought my wild tonic along with me because I thought I'm going to share this with him and see what he has to say about it. And so I opened it up and he tried it and he liked it. And, and I said, well, what do you think? And he just, he looked at me right in the eyes and he's like, Holly, there are no rules in fermentation. And when he said that, it was almost like it just gave me the permission to treat the fermentation like an art form. And it just allowed me to really push the boundaries. And, and so I left there just being completely freed up to think about it in a different way. Mm. And that's when I started experimenting with the alcohol ferment. I took um, the non-alcohol and I started just really being the mad scientist around. I want to create a healthy alcohol, uh, something that's an alternative to beer, wines, or ciders. And so I went about creating a whole new category of alcohol, which was um, the hard gin kombucha that we have now on the market. And since then, it's like all of the big players are coming into the market and um, we're still a relatively small company, but um, tremendous growth potential. Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes the, the smaller companies are way more nimble and can and make those decisions, do those things that the larger companies can't. Um, I want to hear about the early days, Holly, selling out of the back of your car. Oh my when God. you first started doing this, were you thinking, I want to start a business of this or how did that how did that occur? Well, it was, yeah, I did want to start a business. You did. And funny thing is, is um, I was looking to hire our first employee and it was a bookkeeper. And so of course, having no history, I had traveled to Sedona, fell in love with Sedona and the area here. And so she would, so I, I, you know, put an ad out and she responded and she met me at a local coffee shop and this is how small we were. So we're sitting down for the, for our interview. And she called up her husband and she's like, hey, um, they're legit. I'm okay. You know, you don't have to worry about them kidnapping me, basically. <laughs> and so we, we've gone from, you know, from that, you know, and, and also, you know, I did everything from, you know, uh, filling kegs myself to um, delivering product to sales. I mean, you name it. I was, you wore all the hats because you had to in a small company. And we still have a few of our um, folks with us that started who um, are just wonderful people. And, you know, I thought, well, maybe I should hire other people who are from the beer world or from the wine world. But in a way, kombucha is really its own animal. You can't bring in people with a preconceived notion of what it is to make this ferment because it will just drive them crazy. You know, it's a whole different process. I think all like many of the people I've met who like kombucha, who are just like experimenting themselves. It's really about the craft of creating it. And it, like you said, it's kind of like a, a little art form. You experiment. I remember my first batch, I was like dropping fresh raspberries in just to see what the flavor would taste like. So I could totally get that mad scientist feel of what you're talking about. Oh yeah. The first, your first sales. What did your, your first sales look like as far as what, what did you actually offer um, out there? Like, cause now you're crafting it and now you're like, okay, I'm ready to sell this stuff. Well, our first customers were really small mom and pop, you know, restaurants and coffee shops. And um, I remember when we first broke into uh, natural grocers, natural grocers was one of our first chains and it was a big deal. Um, you know, and, and I almost felt like, oh my gosh, we're going to be exiled from natural grocers because one of their head managers came to work for us early on. And, you know, I was like, uh oh, <laughs> but we're still being sold by natural grocers and I'm a huge fan of their, their chain. But it was, it was just a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of compliance, a lot of, you know, getting all of the, you know, all of the paperwork filled in to get into these major chains is almost a full time job. Right. Um, I want to talk about a little bit of fulfillment. Like you get the first big order. It's got to be hard because if you're used to producing a certain amount and then producing more, but, but backing up a little bit, Holly, with were the original ones, was it a farmer market where you just calling your friends and they were buying it? What were some of those initial customers? So the initial customers were local um, people here in Sedona. And, you know, a lot of them still sell wild tonic today, which is really cool. 
Um, you know, there's there's places um, like the okay. One of our first customers, for example, is here in Old Town Cottonwood, the Red Rooster, and they are a local uh, breakfast and lunch place. And you know, they they took a chance on us. Everybody that sold our product in the beginning was really taking a chance on this new company. And so you just got to know the owners and. Um, you know, I frequented a lot of the places where I sold my product and became yeah. friends. With those you're folks. like ordering, you're like, by the way, I think kombucha would be good on the menu here. And, yeah, and like, exactly. oh, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah, that's how it goes. And, yeah. you know, it just evolved from there. Um, you know, what I do think- they purchase? Do they, do they say, let's start with a six pack? I mean, what are those, some of those initial customers, how much are they buying in the beginning? Um, they would buy like- two or three cases and okay. they would keep it in their cold storage, whatever they could fit in their cold storage. Okay. And, you know, we had um, some good customers in Sedona as well. And, um, and then even up in Flagstaff. So, you know, it was very local, very yeah. local. And it also sold um, wild tonic at the farmer's market. So that's how we reached a lot more people is on the, the weekends. We don't do that anymore, but um you know, it's also sold at the farmer's market. It would be pop, probably be popular. But what about, do you remember the first big order? And how, because there's a whole, there's the craft and there's a selling. And now it's like you, there's a lot of operations involved in, in the oh, production. Yeah. Well, we started in a 3,000 square foot brewery. And, you know, I um, started with these turn of the century soup kettles for fermentation vats. And we um, bought all of the equipment from this little um, microbrewery in Hood River, Oregon, put it in the back of our trailer, drove it to Sedona, started wow. in the 3,000 square foot space with two or three people. And it was very, um, very much a homegrown operation. And then we realized very quickly that the demand was going to quickly outgrow our equipment. So, um, my uh, ex-husband is a physicist and he and I started masterminding the design of new equipment and worked with a tank producer um, and designed a lot of these large tanks and, and the fermentation equipment needed to make the kombucha. And then um, we moved into a, a very large space about four blocks away. We bought a, a, a building and that's now the home of Wild Tonic and we're about 36,000 square feet now. So we kind of grew up, we grew very quickly, very exponentially. And all of the people on our team, uh, we actually hired tradesmen who were people who were in the construction field, who were in the, um, who had worked at breweries and installed all the cooling systems necessary. So now we really have a state of the art facility, but it didn't happen overnight. It happened over years. Um, we're six years old now. And it's really been a, a progression and a learning experiment, uh, a lot of trial and error. You know, you learn from your mistakes. It's very costly to um, basically invest in a business that is where there's no model for it. If you think about wine or you think about beer or you think about mead, there's books written on those things. Yeah. There's a precedent set on how to do that. With kombucha, it's very secretive. Nobody wants to share what they know because it's such a competitive cutting edge industry. And so you pretty much have to figure it out yourself. And if you don't, then, you know, you're, you're kind of, you get stuck. And we've had a lot of, a lot of points in our growth where um, we've had to take a step back and, and figure things out. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about the differences of kombucha, right? And you, we talked about before we hit record, I think you said you produce 3,000 pounds of honey a year or something? Oh, like no, no, way more than that. That's oh, way more. Coat way. So we, um, we're probably one of the largest consumers of honey in the United States because we order probably $100,000 worth of honey a month. I mean, it's a, a lot of honey. Wow. And it's all organic. It's all, we work with one family because so much honey these days has been tainted. So we're very careful about how we source our honey. I know the family who um, has had this um, beekeeping operation for many generations. They're from Brazil and just a beautiful family. They treat the bees very well because it's all organic. They don't use pesticides when they harvest the honey. And, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's very carefully sourced. 
Same with our tea. Our tea is sourced from Bangladesh and it supports a whole community of women to educate their families. And you know, the, the plantation was built on a place that was all desert at one point and now it's this thriving community. So we just were very careful about how we source our yeah. ingredients. Uh, I'm gonna I want you to talk a little about the honey versus sugar version sure. because we were talking about it. But I want to say, I don't know if it was psychological, but I remember when I was drinking the blueberry basil, I was like, I could taste the honey. I don't know if it's because it just looks good on the, you know, it says on the label made with honey. There's a nice like blue glass blown like B and then there's one on the label. I'm like, yes, I could taste the honey. So I don't know if I was tasting it or if it was just like I was seeing the B and I was tasting it, but I swear I could taste the hints of honey in the kombucha and, and it, it was great. What is the difference? Because most people are like, well, kombucha is kombucha, right? So there's the Jun kombucha and then there's made with honey versus sugar. What Talk about the honey versus sugar. So the, so Jun is considered the mother of all kombuchas. Um, the honey is incredibly beneficial to the body. Honey has all kinds of healing qualities. If you Google honey and healing qualities, they've used it since the ancient times as a medicine. And it is assimilated by the body in a way that is much slower than, than assimilated than uh, sugar. So it's considered a whole food. So the body is actually able to treat it as such. And it doesn't give you the highs that sugar does or the lows that sugar does. Um, it's a very sustainable energy. And um, it also has the prebiotics in it, amino acids in it. Um, it's incredibly healing for the gut in general and for the body in general. So it's, uh, it's just, it's considered the champagne of kombucha. So it's yeah. amazing in its flavor profile because it doesn't taste like vinegar. So a lot of people who say, you know, I can't, I can't drink kombucha because it tastes awful. They actually love wild tonic and you'll, you'll see them sneaking to the grocery store and buying kombucha when they would normally, you know, just avoid it like the plague. You know, it sounds, you know, totally logical, but it's not an easy decision if you think about, you know, I'm sure honey is much more expensive than pouring sugar in, in into kombucha, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. incredibly. Yeah, it's very expensive to make. And almost, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's the differentiating factor in our drink. And so I would never give it up, but it also makes it incredibly expensive to produce. Yeah. Talk so people about, are getting quality when they buy yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Um, the alcohol side of things. Um, talk about kind of the evolution of you create, because you, you, you didn't start with the alcohol version, right? You start with the, no. the reg, with non-alcoholic. Yes. At mm -hmm. what point did you decide we need to have an alcoholic version? Well, I got bored. I had to do something new. <laughs> and so I just, I started fermenting. Um, you know, it's funny. I started actually, how do I increase the alcohol content in wild tonic? And so I started experimenting with uh, rice, actually. So I fermented rice and made this ancient rice ferment. And then I just thought, oh my gosh, my brewers are going to kill me because this is too complicated and it's very labor intensive. And how can I simplify this? So I just kept pushing myself to uh, read everything I could on ferments and fermentation, read things I don't even understand. And then somehow it kind of infuses itself into our psyche and it comes out in ways we don't expect. And um, even to this day, I don't share my full recipe with my brew team. They, they, there's unmarked bags that come into the brewery and it's X amount of this and X amount of that. And, you know, and I think that's, I don't know, that secretive mad scientist in me just can't help myself. You know, I just, I love um, inventing. I love creating and whether it's a painting or whether it's uh, a drink or, or cooking dinner. I mean, it's just, it's all an adventure. How was it selling the hard kombucha versus the non-alcoholic? Was it any easier or harder? Um, it's interesting. So in the beginning, um, we had our, our alcohol kombucha at Whole Foods Market and out of a hundred beers, we were in the top five fastest moving products on the shelf. And so I think that's when the larger companies started taking notice because there was one other hard kombucha on the market, had been on the market for maybe a decade. 
before us, but it was a regular kombucha. It wasn't a gin. The flavor had something to be desired. Um, but when the gin came on the market and it started moving so quickly at Whole Foods, I think it caught the attention of a lot of the larger beer producers, whether it be um, Boston Beer, Full Sail Ale. You started seeing a lot of these larger companies Anheuser-Busch, um, they all started coming into the hard kombucha space and now it's quite a thing. And you know, what do they say that a rising tide floats all boats or something like that? Yeah, and you're exactly true. right. Yeah. So now you go into a whole foods, especially on the West. Increases Coast. awareness <laughs> yeah, for everyone. Yeah. And so, you know, there's this whole movement now of um, hard kombucha and it's becoming like the next hard seltzer. And it's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, that that is amazing, actually. And, um, you know, the um, going in and around the do you find that there's bars that are, do, you know, in, implementing this as well? Or is that not in restaurants? Yeah, so we were sold at um, Emerald's New Orleans Fish House on the Strip in Las Vegas. I mean, we're featured on their menu. We have our own little section. They have beers, wines and hard kombucha. And, you know, that's exciting when you start getting into some of these more mainstream type restaurants. And, um, you know, we're sold on tap at a lot of breweries even um, take our, our kombucha and put it on tap because they don't make kombucha. Um, yeah, so it's, you're starting to see it in a lot of mainstream type places. Yeah. Holly, I have two last questions. Before I ask them, I just want to thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And um, I remember walking out of AJ's drinking the wild tonic and being, this is amazing. I took a picture of it. I sent it to your team and I said, this is amazing. I, I don't know who created this, but I love to have him on the podcast. And so thank you for your team for making that happen. And your team's always super responsive whenever uh, I email them. So um, I, know, I know you have an amazing team behind you. Um, before I ask the questions, I want to point people, everyone to go to wildtonic.com, check out their website, check out their flavors. I know wildtonic.com slash flavors is everything they have from the hard tonic, uh, the hard kombucha to the non-alcoholic kombucha. And I'm sure they're at a grocery store near you. Um, are there any other places how we could point people towards where people can get them. I know you mentioned Whole Foods. What mm -hmm. other places can they they go and, and get it? Um, Sprouts, uh, Farmer's Market. So um, starting in March, uh, April. So March and April, we're going to be mandated in all of the Whole Foods. Um, so you'd be able to find our alcohol there. The non-alc, I would um, just go to our website. We have a Find Us um, tab. So depending on what state it is, you'll find the chain that the wild tonic is available in. That's the nice. easiest way to find it. But um, we're at Safeway. We're at um, you know, some of the conventional chains are starting to take our product on and do very well with it. That's amazing. Um, last two questions. Okay. I want to hear about the toughest. What's been some of the tough, uh, tough part of the journey? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud, a proud moment for you? Start with the tough. What's been like a challenging part? of this journey besides every day? No, I'm just kidding. Well, this last year has been really difficult, really difficult because of COVID, you know, all the grocery stores, they want to keep water and toilet paper on the shelves. They're not interested in the latest beverages that are out there. And so, you know, it's been, we've definitely maintained our equilibrium. Um, our sales have been, remained steady, but we haven't had the growth that we've had in past years. But now yeah. all this pent up growth is, kind of uh, is there now for setting into the spring. So I think first quarter is going to be phenomenal. And, um, you know, I think this last year of COVID was really tough because we had to deal with supply chain issues. We had to oh, yeah. um, deal with all of that, compound it with, um, you know, me getting a divorce. And that's been very tough on not just myself, but um, the company. And, you know, I think um, it's been, that's been a huge challenge, but you know, knock on wood, there's no attorneys involved and, you know, it's all going very well. It's just, you know, you devote 16 years of your life to somebody and, you, you know, you make them the front and center of your life. And then all of a sudden they leave and you have to, you know, reinvent yourself. You have to reinvent your tribe. And, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for the friends in my life now that, um, that are here because, 
you know, I'm, I'm realizing the importance of, of not just focusing on one person, you know, you just, it's important to have a tribe of people around, yeah. of friends, of um, people that you love and they, that are like family that maybe aren't family. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. I mean, this, this has been a tough year, I think for everyone and, and from personally and professionally, and I appreciate you sharing that because when people share that type of stuff and getting the support from their friends and family, it allows other people to share that stuff with, with others too, and open up. And, and really when we do that, we open ourselves up to support from the community and other people. So I appreciate you, you sharing that. Uh, on the flip side, what's been some proud moments for you? Um, oh, so I, th I think probably in the very first few years of Wild Tonic, um, the LA Dodgers started drinking wild tonic and they loved it so much that they flew somebody from our brewery wow. across country to New York to bring a bunch of our product to one of their games. And, um, That's the amazing. coach for the LA Dodgers is a big fan. And he wrote this beautiful letter of recommendation of, for wild tonic because they have it on tap there, uh, for their players to drink on a day-to-day -day basis. And wow. even though we can't afford to be an official sponsor. We're like the underground, you know, the underground drink that they go to. And I think they just won the World Series, which is a big deal. And, you know, it was all day, because of Wild Tonic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you yeah. want to win the World Series, you should have Wild Tonic on tap in your clubhouse. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, um, do you see other also, teams picking that up, that trend, or actually, you know. um, the Utah Jazz uh, coach reached out to us and um, for basketball. And you know, I know that there's been others, but you know, I I think uh, LA Dodgers is probably the biggest. Yeah. And you know, and then also a lot of singers seem to be into Wild Tonic. So um, one day out of the blue, I get this email from um, the president of of the singer Jewel. And he's like, Jules, a big fan of your drink. And, and so she and I have now become good friends because we both have that background of being born and raised in Alaska. You know, for me, I have a third generation Alaskan and she's her, her parents homesteaded there as well. We have so much in common and she's just a delightful spirit. You know what? I, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for the product you create. Everyone should check out wildtonic.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast and we'll see you next time. Thank Thanks, you, Jeremy. Holly. Thanks so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.